Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a sixth grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features live closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides an equal opportunity for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity in every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series seven years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is about Islamophobia in schools. Although it has been 20 years since the tragic events of September 11th, Islamophobia is still a challenge in Washington state schools. Our panelists today are Maham Khan, a student at West Valley High School in Yakima, Dana Ahmed, a student at the University of Washington, Anila Afzali, Executive Director at the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, Nagmana Shirazi with the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Gonzaga University and a candidate for Spokane City Council, Sabia Khan, a community advocate in the Tri-Cities, and Zara Roach Khan, Executive Director of the Benton Franklin Children's Development Center and a representative on the Pasco City Council. They will describe the impacts of Islamophobia and share strategies and resources to address Islamophobia when it arises. They will also answer your questions. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome, Maham, Dana, Anila, Nagmana, Sabia, and Zara. What we're going to do is have each of you talk for about five or six minutes on the background of Islamophobia in schools and share any stories that you'd like to share. And then after that, we'll move into possible solutions, resources, and strategies to address Islamophobia when it arises. So we're going to start with Maham. Maham Khan is a student at West Valley High School. She has taken leadership classes in the past and was president of K Kids, a community service club created by Kiwanis. She has volunteered many community service hours with the West Valley Kiwanis Club. And in October of 2020, she joined LEV as a panelist in our webinar about what students need now. Maham, what has been your experience with Islamophobia in schools? Um, actually, my experience has been pretty good. Um, as a girl who wears hijab in school since fifth grade, um, uh, I haven't really felt uh, faced any discrimination. Um, but I know that there are a lot of other Muslim kids in my um, school district um, and a lot of other Muslim girls who aren't comfortable uh, wearing a hijab because um, of Islamophobia. And um, so, because uh, in my uh, city, we have a Sunday school. And so in the Sunday school, we um, have two buildings, basically one where we held our classes and one where our mosque is. And so um, in Islam, we have five daily prayers. 
And so after Sunday school, we would go to the se uh, attend the second daily prayer. And between our two buildings, there's really like a two minute walk. Um, it's very, very short. But even there, um, my dad would require adult supervision um, at all times, just because he was afraid um, that people were going to um, hurt us or run over us with their cars, which has happened now. Um, uh, recently in Canada, a family was run over by a semi truck uh, because of an uh, because that person was, had Islamophobia, and so my dad was afraid of that, and that that was going to happen to us. So even like for that short walk, um, we had to have adult supervision, um, and uh, there were a lot of other things that happened to our mosque, like it was vandalized. Um, we, people have left statues and other artifact, church artifacts in front of our mosque. Um, and even our Sunday school building where kids would come, uh, the windows have been smashed. Um, they found a bullet hole. Uh, and that's really scary when there's, you know, like kids at, um, using the building. And when you know that that's happening, it can be scary sometimes to go out. And, um, and I know there's some girls who aren't um, comfortable wearing a hijab because they're scared of what, my, um, what other people will react um, and what's going to happen if they do. But yeah, that, uh, but otherwise my school district, um, it's not that diverse, uh, but they're all really nice and kind, um, which I'm really grateful for because I know a lot of people have had a lot of bad experiences and I'm really happy and lucky that I haven't had those yet. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Maham. I really appreciate that. I would like to move on to, uh, to Dana, Donna Ahmed. She's a UW student and she's a native to the Tri-Cities. Donna, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate that. What has been your experience with Islamophobia in schools? Hi, I'm actually very happy to be here. Um, very similar to Maham, I had a pretty good experience because I don't wear the hijab, so visually looking at me, you wouldn't know I'm Muslim unless it's something that's announced, obviously. But for the most part, I've had good experiences. Um, the biggest thing mostly is miscon misconceptions about Islam and just like petty comments, things like that, just um, things like non-educated um, statements that people make for the most part. I had a pretty good experience in school aside from like hearing little things from people. I think that's just like a lack of education type of thing. And I think it comes from home. So it's not really something that can be erased, but future generations moving forward, I think can do a better job at educating their children and making sure like, you know, they know the roots of Islam. Um, but holistically, when I look at it in the community, you can tell that it's an issue. Um, one thing that I think about is how like during Eid, a um, little bit different this year because of COVID, but as we move forward in years, I see like, a higher demand for security and just having police around for the safety of Muslims in the community. I think that's huge. Um, but for the most part, when we're talking about schools specifically um, and the things that we need to see, I think it's just education, teachers educating students. And I think a lot of that starts at home because Islamophobia, as far as it goes, um, you know, adults can only do so much, but the peers that you're attending these schools with are the ones that affect you most. So the things that they say to you are very effective. Um, but it's just like having a supportive peer system, having a supportive school system, staff that you can go talk to about these different things. And fortunately, I got to grow up with, you know, Muslim staff members like Sobiha was one of the teachers at my school. So, you know, I'd be able to talk to her even like during fasting and stuff. I'd have an adult I'd be able to go talk to. So um, even if there aren't Muslim teachers in the schools, just being understanding of what Muslim students need as a whole, I think that's what the best thing you can do for Muslim students is. Thank you so much, Donna. I really appreciate you sharing. Anila Afzali is the executive director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. Maps, amen. She also serves as a governing board member of the Faith Action Network and advisory member of Washington for Black Lives on the steering committee of the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, a part of the Wa Tech Equity Coalition, a founding member of Al and Faith, and a member of the National Combating Islamophobia Roundtable. 
Anila is an attorney and graduate of Harvard Law School who worked at two law firms in Seattle, making partner at one, before building and leading the legal department as general counsel of a local healthcare IT company. In addition to her legal practice, Anila co-founded MILA, the Middle Eastern Legal Association of Washington, and served as inaugural president for two years. The Washington State Bar Association honored Anila with its Excellent in Excellence in Diversity Award, and the Washington Law and Politics recognized her as a rising star multiple years. In 2013, after a spiritual awakening and witnessing the growing divisiveness in our country, Anila left her legal career to pursue knowledge and service, two things her faith emphasizes. Since then, Anila has served as community activist, interfaith leader, educator and presenter, events coordinator, strategic advisor, civil rights advocate, and seeker of knowledge. She founded MAPS Amen in December 2016 to educate our fellow Americans about Islamophobia, Islam and Muslims, to build coalitions and mobilize allies to take effective action against hate and toward achieving peace and justice for all, challenge negative stereotypes and misinformation in the media, and empower and engage the American Muslim community to become future leaders in our country. Anila's work with faith and non-faith communities has helped to increase understanding of Islam and Muslims, build relationships across religious, racial, cultural, and political differences, create alliances to advocate for justice together, including combating Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate, and promote dignity, fairness, and respect for all. Anila, thanks so much for joining us. What is your experience with Islamophobia in schools? Thank you so much, Eric, and everybody for joining us. That was much longer in terms of the bio than I expected, but uh, appreciate it and uh, happy to be here with everybody and appreciate these kinds of programs and hopefully creating the kind of change that we all want to see with respect to all forms of hatred against all marginalized communities and others. So I want to start by just mentioning that this year, the UN issued a report and UN leaders talked about how anti-Muslim hatred has reached epidemic proportions, according to their words. And it is very common to see and hear uh, anti-Muslim stereotypes, misinformation, myths, um, hatred, bias, bigotry promoted at all levels uh, in, in our country. And it has led to direct impact on individuals, including, of course, students. Uh, one of the things that's really disturbing to me personally is that according to studies uh, uh, with like, for example, the ISPU, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, in their study, they said that 42% of American Muslim students face bullying, which is the highest of any religious or faith group. Uh, that's compared to 23% of Jewish students and 10% of the general population. And the most disturbing part about that for me was hearing that one out of four Muslim students who face bullying in schools is actually at the hands that that bullying comes or harassment comes at the hands of teachers or school administrators. That's really devastating. And when we have this kind of environment where anti-Muslim sentiment is being promoted in media, through Hollywood, uh, in our legal system, and more, uh, it inevitably has an impact directly on students. Me as an adult, I, I can handle the Islamophobia that I face on a daily basis, the microaggressions, the myths that are constantly perpetuated. But to hear about our students who are facing it, that is particularly disheartening and troubling to me. And it's Muslim students and other students. Students, and I really uh, am a firm believer that these various forms of anti any group hate are connected, that these various forms of oppression are absolutely connected. So when we allow anti Muslim bigotry to fester, it directly has an impact on students of other backgrounds as well. So that's that's one point I want to make uh, abundantly clear there. And then specifically with the, the kind of impact that we are seeing even in Washington state, even though like uh, uh, our, our previous two students have indicated, Washington is a better environment than some other places uh, for Muslim students, but that does not mean that we are immune here in Washington state from the kind of anti-Muslim bigotry that is promoted, again, even at times at the hands of teachers and school administrators. For example, my niece, when she was in sixth or seventh grade in a Washington school, she was in a class where the teacher came out and talked about how uh, sort of Muslims were responsible for uh, the, the horrifying 
terrifying incident on uh, 9-11. So that's, that's the kind of thing where she as a Muslim student in her class is there facing this from a teacher and she decided to take action by writing a letter to the teacher and explaining how that kind of bigoted view is really problematic and has a direct impact on people like her in the class. And the teacher apologized to her, but didn't do anything to repair the consequences of those teachings to the entire rest of the class. And we're seeing those kinds of behaviors um, happen uh, across the state of Washington. Uh, most recently, one of the examples of, uh, that I saw of anti-Muslim uh, sentiment that students experienced is on the website of a couple Washington schools, there was a, a picture of an anti-Muslim uh, Hindutva, a Hindu sort of national supremacist kind of group uh, pictured there uh, as doing a service project. And it was sort of positively uh, framed there, but they had their signage that was very pro RSS, pro sort of uh, the, the uh, government and military forces in India that are very strongly anti-Muslim. And this is being promoted on a Washington school and the students who are Muslim there or Dalit or other marginalized communities, when they see this being endorsed by the school, it has a detrimental impact on the students themselves. I mean, I myself have experienced many different forms of anti-Muslim bigotry, uh, but again, the, the harm to students is something that really concerns me. And then most of the kinds of anti-bullying programs, which we absolutely need to have in schools and school districts, many of the forms of anti-bullying uh, programs or trainings fail to have a cultural competency component or fail to have a religious literacy component. And this is particularly problematic when it comes to a marginalized uh, group like Muslims, because the, the number of American Muslims uh, is, is very small. It's about 1% of the American population. And when you have that tiny minority, and then you have not just sort of the, the various forms of anti-Muslim sentiment we see in media, Hollywood, and everything else, but you actually have a full-on industry that promotes anti-Muslim hate. This, this is termed the Islamophobia industry or Islamophobia network. And it's this industry that is promoting many of the myths and misconceptions that everyday American Muslims, children and parents have to deal with. And it's very heartbreaking when children, even at as young as an ele elementary age, when they are forced to answer things like theological questions that no other group, no other faith group um, has to answer or explain or justify. Uh, and we're also seeing the sort of otherization when the holidays that uh, members of religious minorities, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Jewish, whether it's uh, Sikh or other uh, religious minorities, when they don't have their holidays or um, celebrations recognized in any way. And in fact, we've had incidents with the uh, Seattle Public Schools even starting kindergarten on the first day of Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, which is problematic. So it's this kind of, sometimes it's insensitivity, sometimes it's failure to address uh, the actual bullying and harassment that's happening. Sometimes it's the failure of training of our educators in how to respond to this and how to adjust the bias within themselves. All of these are part of the problem. And that's why it's so critical for us to have programs like this. And I'm very grateful uh, to, uh, for having this opportunity to talk about ways that we could come together and discuss appropriate strategies and solutions. Because I will say every Muslim that I know has faced some level of anti-Muslim bigotry, whether it's you know minor microaggressions, even though those are not micro oftentimes when they accumulate and the harm is not micro, but whether it's that or it's full on attacks, having their hijabs pulled off, uh, being bullied in front of students, uh, other students, uh, being called out by their teachers at times, having to answer for horrifying incidents. All of those are instances that we see in classrooms, unfortunately, and it's incumbent upon us to come together and make sure that no child in the state of Washington or anywhere is abused in our environmental educational system. And that's where cultural competency, anti-bullying and religious literacy are really important. And I hope we'll get to talk about sort of what individuals and the school districts and uh, teachers can do as well in addressing the anti-Muslim hate that we see uh, very prevalent uh, across our country. Absolutely, thank you so much, Anila. Yes, we will definitely get to that. Stay tuned. Nagmana Shirazi emigrated to Houston in 2008, and she moved to Spokane in 2012 with her son. 
She has so far loved living in Spokane with its four seasons and unique landscape. Originally from Karachi, Pakistan, she has had the good fortune of traveling since an early age and has been educated and lived and worked on four different continents. She considers herself a global citizen. Since coming to live in Spokane, she has become an advocate, an activist, and a feminist, speaking out on topics related to misogyny, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and racism. She became involved in politics in 2015, when a hate group out of Western Washington garnered about 3,000 signatures to place a racial profiling petition on the ballot that would have empowered any city employee to ask for documentation. Nagmana co-chaired a coalition of 28 organizations that defeated the initiative in Spokane's courts, then in appellate court, and then finally it was thrown out after review in Olympia. She has formed alliances and coalitions to bring issues and disparities around people of color and minorities to the forefront. She serves on the boards of Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane, Refugee Connections Spokane, Greater Spokane Progress, Asian Pacific Islander Coalition Spokane, and South Asian Americans for Washington Together, and is a member of the Spokane Coalition of Color, which is an amalgamation of the Hispanic Business Professional Association, NAACP Spokane Branch, Muslims for Community Action and Support, and Asian Pacific Islander Coalition Spokane. She co-chairs Sisterhood of Salam Shalom Spokane Chapter and is the chair of Muslims for Community Action and Support. A cytogenetic technologist by profession, she changed her focus from working in the STEM field to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging several years ago. She has now worked for two years in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Gonzaga University and is currently running for Spokane City Council from District 1 to be the next elected city council person representing that district. Nagamana, what has been your experience with Islamophobia in schools? Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about what's happening in Spokane and what's been my experience talking to people and living here in Spokane and, uh, and it's related to schools. So um, I'm a single mom. I have a young son. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> when I moved to Spokane, he was only about 11 years old. So he um, has been to public school and then he went for a little while to private school and then he moved on to uh, back into public school system, which I really think is uh, the best thing that happened to him because he finally graduated with, with a good GPA and everything. But my personal experience has been with all the schools and, and the fact that I work in higher ed in, uh, in Spokane, uh, you have to realize that Spokane itself is 88% white. And, you know, we can only pull diverse folks, only so many diverse folks into certain areas. And um, not a lot of them are Muslim. So it kind of defeats the purpose of the diversity aspect of it when students are there. And I know, like, for instance, at Ferris High School, they speak almost like 137 different languages. Uh, at Lewis and Clark, like a hundred, uh, something like that, something similar. So there's a lot of diversity amongst our students, but there is not a lot of diversity amongst our staff and faculty. And it's difficult for, especially like when you're a Muslim student and you know, you, there's all this oppression and we know that there's all this surveillance going on at the mosque. Parents don't take their children to the mosque every Friday necessarily, only perhaps once a month or maybe just for festivals because a lot of the students don't want to go. They're like, no, I, I'm afraid and, and don't want to identify. This is what I'm seeing, seeing amongst the younger um, school, like middle school age children amongst my community. It's really disheartening for me, but it's, uh, and Maham was talking about, uh, you know, the Sunday school. I was one of the few people who actually we started the second set of the Sunday school uh, offerings that we that we did it for a little bit. But then, of course, it's, it's just it's it's heartrending how much we have to explain um, to parents the safety aspect of it and the security aspect of it. That's one huge issue. But then in public schools. Students don't walk into a classroom or an office or the front desk and they don't see, I mean, they don't see people who look like them. So they don't identify uh, with folks who are like them. And if they have issues, they're less likely to go and talk to a teacher about those things. They're less likely to ask 
for directions or for advice if they're suffering any kind of injustice or a need. You know, uh, international students come to Washington State University. We have WSU, we have e EWU, we have Gonzaga, we have uh, uh, Whitworth. You, there's so many universities here. And yet, what are we doing as a collective whole to make sure that these students' needs are met who are Muslim, for instance? You know, do they have information on where do they go for food? Where, you know, our, our dietary requirements, et cetera. And just plain people who look like me, for instance, you know, being available and there in, 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 the, in, the, in the public eye, in, in the open for them to be able to connect with and have that high school, upper ed, whatever experience of being in, a, in an environment where, they, where their needs are met and they're recognized as having a certain set of requirements that are not the same as everybody else. That boils down to diversity, that boils down to uh, meeting a need, that boils down to being open and, and being able to retain and attract those students uh, of color and of different uh, minorities and ethnicities and religions uh, in, into our school systems and to our college systems, et cetera. So that's where my issue is that, you know, we, we do not provide enough um, interaction that students can rely on um, at, at, at the faculty and staff level when we're talking about Islamophobia. So when you're, when you're already, when there's this huge gap, so there's nobody that who can educate um, faculty and staff on what it needs to be or what it means to be Muslim or what a Muslim student's needs are, there's automatically going to be bias, there's automatically going to be disparities, there's automatically going to be issues which are not surmountable because we just don't have a, a means to do it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that, Nagmana. Sabia Khan is a community advocate in the Tri-Cities. Among her many honors, she received the 2020 Outstanding Community Advocate Award from the Council on American Islamic Relations. Her daughter, Zara Khan Roach, will introduce her. Thank you for letting me have this privilege. Um, Sabia Khan is not only my mother, but she is also a high school history teacher, a former special education teacher, and also everything but dissertation in international relations. She is a Pakistani American, a Muslim who is active in her local Tri-Cities community, she advocates for BIPOC and underserved and underrepresented communities. She currently serves uh, the Richland School Board on a commission for the Richland School Board um, on inclusivity, diversity, and equity. And she is known by her friends and family as a shaker and a mover. People are always stopping me to tell me how cool my mom is, which to which I respond, I know. Um, Sabia Khan is also a grandmother to three rambunctious kids. She is currently wrangling this summer to get them to do their Arabic and Quran lessons every day. So I'm very grateful to her for that. <laughs> so I don't have to do it. Um, and Sabia Khan is beloved in her Muslim community, the Islamic Center of Tri-Cities. Um, she recently was recognized, as you just said, um, uh, Eric, by CARE as the Washington Advocate of the Year. So with that, I will let you take over, Ami, and talk about your experiences of Islamophobia in the schools. Oh, thank you, Sabiha. You're on mute, by the way. Excuse me. Uh, I just wanted to start out by saying that Islamophobia is a global phenomena. And it's a very deep-seated and a very old uh, phenomena. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Hollywood, for example, in the movie Arabian Nights, you see that the depiction of an Arab Muslim with a hooked nose and a dishonest person. Um, in in uh, Othello's tragic Shakespeare, Othello smites the circumcised and the turbanized Turk. And so, I mean, I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's in the Western... Uh, mind, Muslims are bad. And so it is so deep rooted and so deep seated. But in the United States, prior to 9-11, there was complete ignorance about Islam. Post 9-11, there is complete demonization of Islam. 
in terms of the school, I mean, I can go on for a very long time because I have a lot of experience. With, I mean, I have not had too many Muslim students per se in my classrooms. Um, that only started happening when we started getting the refugees from first from Bosnia and then Afghanistan and then Syria and Iraq. Um, so um, students, um, you guys have already uh, iterated the fact that the people, uh, the students relate to those who look like them or who understand or who find an adult who is, uh, they can safely share their feelings with. So uh, I had Dana as a student and um, she would come to me and, and uh, at many occasions, not just where like she came on the first day of Ramadan and said, hey, how's your fast going? Um, and I said, you know, fine. And how's yours going? So I mean, it's good to, even though I don't have another adult to relate to myself. So when students come and relate to me, it's heartening. But then at other times, Dana and other students have come to me and said, hey, this history teacher said this about the Arab-Israeli conflict. How can you, you know, what do you think about it? And then I have, you know, I explain it in my, uh, and so that's something that yeah, I think uh, Nagmana and somebody else mentioned as well, that the adults have a lot of, I think um, Anila did, the bullying comes from the adult in different ways and in, in very subtle ways. So I have lots of stories, but I'll, I'll try to share one or two. I'm going to put Dana on the spot for a little bit. One thing that I want to say is that students do not like to express that they have been bullied. They don't like to admit it in the open. And to me, I mean, Maham just said that. I was just waiting for her to share something, if not about her, maybe about a peer, maybe about a story that she's heard in the community. So uh, most kids, and even many adults like to say, we don't face this, you know, I mean, people around here are very nice. And, and I used to say that about my, my kids went to a private Catholic school and they were really nice about um, Ramadan and they would acknowledge that we are fasting and so on. But um, Dana, uh, at one of the care meetings when we had with the politicians, and I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, Dana. Uh, she uh, did share um, and, uh, the fact that she was uh, bullied and harassed by, I believe it was a peer who basically said something like, uh, do you want to go ahead and, and plant a bomb right here to her? And she, when she was sharing that in, in, the, in the meeting, she broke down in tears and she started crying and everybody was so touched. That's the first time I had met or heard Dana because she was still in middle school and I didn't get to know her yet. But she never, ever brought that up again. In fact, CARE did a survey for high school student Muslims about bullying, and they sent me those forms. And I went around asking and begging Muslim students to fill it out. First of all, hardly anybody would fill them out. And those who did, I can bet you that Dana never mentioned that. Tell me if I'm wrong, Dana. She never mentioned that incidence in that survey either even though there was a place in that survey which said, if anything has happened to you in the past, not, I mean, this, the survey was mostly about high school, but if anything has happened in the past, please share that as well. So that's my biggest concern about Islamophobia in the schools. One other quick story, I had a student from one of the African, a foreign exchange student from N Nigeria or Niger or one of those countries. She used to wear a, not a hijab, she used to wear this African head dress, like real fancy hat type, but she was a Muslim. So when she came to the school, the, the school secretary told her to take that thing off because we have a no hat policy, but mostly that no hat policy is for boys. But she made that girl take off her hat. That girl came to my room sobbing. She sobbed all day. I, I still cannot get, this happened like seven or eight years ago. She sobbed all day. She was a host in the home of the publisher of the Tri-City Herald, um, who was, by the way, African-American, but not a Muslim. And I told her, I'm going to call his, her host dad, and I can call her parents in Africa, and I'm going to go talk to the school secretary 
and explain to her that this is not just a religious thing, but this is also part. She, and when she was sobbing, she told me that this is the first time in her life that she had to take this thing off. I mean, I, I, I can't even tell you without getting emotional about it because she sobbed all day. I told her to come back into my classroom at lunch and she was still sobbing. And then the next day I went to her in the morning and I said, okay, let's, let's do something about this. She begged me and she said, I've talked to my parents in Africa and they have specifically asked me not to say anything to anybody, not to say a thing to the school principal or the school secretary or your host dad. Just leave it with your teacher, your history teacher, you know, share what you got to share and ask her also, beg her not to bring that up. You are there for a, for a year stay, just make peace, stay there, come back. So that should give you an idea of what kids go through. Another student at our school, she was uh, used to wear a hijab and there was a substitute who did not allow her a practice. And because she didn't have the 10 practices, she was not able to uh, play the game match. Because the substitute said, no, I don't have anything in my sub plans. So I'm not going to allow you to play today because you're not allowed this. This dress is not acceptable to um, play basketball. I, I think it was basketball that she was in. So um, there's story after story. And, and I, I mean, I feel bullied by, I mean, I feel harassed by students when this, the, the comments that students make about me, well, I'm a well-grounded person and I feel I'm comfortable in myself. It doesn't bother me, but when I hear those things and I feel, oh, I mean, I think about the fact, how do students feel about it? it? It breaks my heart. And I want more students, more Danas and more Mahams to speak up uh, because that's what I used to do too. I used to say, no, we don't have any problem in the Tri-Cities. My kids do just fine at St. Pat's. Everybody is asking them questions about Ramadan. And back to Anila's point or so whoever said that is uh, the insensitivity of the first day of kindergarten and Rosh Hashanah. Well, the United States attacked Iraq on, in Ramadan. It was the first or the second of Ramadan when we attacked and it was being shown live. That was the first live war shown. So I always start off with the semester by saying world geography and social studies is the most important subject that you will ever study. Because if you don't know your social sciences, then you will fight the wrong wars, you will attack the wrong countries, and you will tar target the wrong people. Mm. You know, maybe my time is up, so I'll stop, right? Oh, wow. So yeah, that was very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and Donna, thank you for sharing your, your truth with uh, Sabiha and, and everything else you do. And, and Mahan, thanks again. We'll, we'll get back to you in just a moment. Zahra Khan Roach was recently hired as the executive director of the Benton Franklin Children's Developmental Center. The Benton Franklin Children's Developmental Center has been serving families in Benton and Franklin counties for over 40 years and is the leading neurodevelopmental center in the region. Zara Khan Roach is also the only at large, in other words, not assigned to a district representative on the Pasco City Council and began her term in January 2020. Pasco has been home to Councilwoman Roach since 1988. She's a proud graduate of Washington State University Tri-Cities and went on to reach her master's degree in teaching at Simmons University. Councilwoman Roach first worked as a paraprofessional in the Pasco School District before becoming a teacher. She has worked in special education and life skills classrooms, New Horizons High School, and Pasco High School within Pasco School District for seven years before she and her husband began their own family. Prior to joining the Pasco City Council, Councilwoman Roach served on Pasco's planning commission for eight years. She has been a WSU Master Gardener, a board member of the Children's Developmental Center, a board member of the Children's Developmental Center Foundation, a Benton Franklin Fair and Rodeo Scholarship Committee person, and a Benton Franklin League of Women Voters member. She is passionate about community service and her hometown of Pasco. Zara, what has been your experience with Islamophobia in schools? Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I, I also just want to say I wish that I had 
My mom is a high school history teacher uh, when I was growing up or a social studies teacher in middle school. Um, I did not have that privilege, but you know, in Pasco in Eastern Washington, uh, when I was growing up in the late eighties to through the nineties, there was uh, very little diversity, you know, a uh, Latino population, a small African-American population, um, you know, like a 0% Asian or South Asian uh, population. And so in the, in the public schools and the elementary school system, a lot of people that just made the assumption that I was Latina and, um, so I kind of skated by on that, not knowing at a young age that, you know, I should let my identi identity be known. Um, when I went to, when I started in the fifth grade at uh, a Catholic private school here, um, you know, I didn't at that time realize, I don't think I was cognizant of it in the moment, um, but it was, a four years of extreme bullying on a daily basis, you know, being left out, you know, class birthday parties, and I would be the only one un not invited. Um, and so, and I was the only non-Catholic in that class. Um, luckily, you know, I tell my kids now, you only need one good friend. And I had one good friend in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and I'm still really good friends with her. So, um, but that was, you know, that was kind of like the time where it really was, it built, it built my grit, right, for the future. Um, extremely painful in the moment and my teacher then, and looking back at it and reflecting on that time now in adulthood, I realized that, you know, that was othering. What was happening to me was othering. I was brown, I was different. I was not the same religion. Um, I did different things like fasted and, uh, you know, didn't eat all day and had to sit in the cafeteria with the kids and then go to basketball practice afterwards. And my dad would bring me a Subway sandwich and I would get special permission from the coach to take a five minute break and go eat my sandwich and drink some water and then get back into to practice. Um, and so I never recall at any point in from elementary through eighth grade ever learning anything about Pakistani or South Asian or Asian history or, you know, I recall the learning about geography, right? The continents and the states and the capitals and things like that, but that's it. So I, when I got into high school, you know, still the same demographic, but um, you know, history classes then expanded to including some of those uh, more specifics in geography and history. And so I recall we had a huge lecture hall. And at lecture hall, many of the different sections of history class would come together and sit in that lecture hall. So you would have a couple hundred students. And I was a junior in high school. And the history teacher, he was a, a white male. Um, and he got up there and he was going to give a lecture um, on Islam and his, his lecture included, you know, the restrictions on, on women's rights, uh, their, the enforcement of covering, um, and that if you lived in Saudi Arabia and you stole anything, your hand would be cut off. And I, and, and being the only Muslim in you know, one of two Muslims in the school at that time, um, out of hundreds of students, it was, it felt very jarring and very, um, yeah, incomplete that that was all that was shared about Islam or being a Muslim, right? Uh, like none of my experience was there. And so I, I would just echo what my mom said, you know, what what my classmates, what my friends, neighbors, uh, teachers, even, it was like the reference point for Islam and Muslims were Hollywood and were stereotypes and that's it. Um, you know, most definitely like I, I went on to become a high school English teacher and, you know, just recently Washington State Supreme Court uh, weighed in on on students right for uh, First Amendment uh, freedom of speech and and so I always told my students if you read something in a book 
um, that is a bad word, you're allowed to say it in this class because I don't wanna censor you. And I don't wanna censor myself right now either in just my own experience, but you know, growing up in high school when people would find out that I was Muslim and if they did not like me, did not like my identity, not, I don't think it was that they, they didn't like me. Um, you know, they would call me uh, raghead, towel head, uh, camel jockey, sand nigger, um, just, you know, terrorists, all of those things. And I say those words because they're powerful and they're sharp and they, they cut. And so um, those are all the things that, you know, I absorbed in adolescence. Um, and I didn't have a teacher like my mom at that time. And so when I became a teacher myself, I became a high school English teacher and simultaneously I volunteered at my local mosque uh, as a Sunday school teacher for the adolescent, for the middle school class. And as I listened to those middle school Muslim students tell me, um, you know, their own experience in schools about being bullied, about Islamophobic comments, um, bigotry, and it enraged me to find out that it wasn't just coming from their peers, that it was coming from their teachers and that principals were co-signing on it because I took it a step further after talking to my Sunday school students and going to the parents and thinking, okay, this is a, this is one of those immigrant things where parents who are immigrants to the, to the United States feel very shy about confronting authority and they're not going to do it. So I would take it to the parent, that student's parent and say, have you called the school? Have you called the teacher? Have you called the counselor and the principal? What have you done? And some of them had taken it up, you know, all the way up the flagpole to who it should go to and had been dismissed. They had been politely dismissed and shooed to the side um, and invalidated, frankly. And so, you know, that added fuel to my fire of, the injustice that our kids, our children, their identities are under attack in the media, in movies, in school, and by the authorities that are supposed to be creating a safe environment for them to, to learn, to be educated. And that's, that's absolutely the opposite of what's happening. And so my mom and I, you know, we surveyed the whole Sunday school, um, you know, 50 plus kids and out of it, 100%, 100% of them said they had uh, endured Islamophobic attacks in the school setting. Um, and more than 50% of them had said that they had endured it from a teacher. And so we decided, well, we have to do something about this and what can we do? Well, let's get you know, let's, let's do something constructive. Let's get teachers trained. Let's get them diversity training. Let's um, advocate for more professional development so that teachers understand the demographic of the students that they're teaching. And so um, one of the things my mom did was cultivate a relationship with a, um, a uh, PhD student at, uh, I think it was George Washington or University in the DC area. And she was, her whole thesis was about, you know, curriculum um, and, and having historical, historically accurate curriculum, especially as it pertained to Islam and Muslims. And so she, you know, my mom was wonderful about going through the proper channels, the educational service district, one, two, three, locally and uh, had it approved for credit clock hours for teachers to take the course. Um, you know, and I was in the Pasco School District and I remember sharing that clock hour training. So OSPI, the Office of Superintendent uh, and Public Instruction and all the educational service districts, they, they send out email notifications about what the upcoming trainings are. And so I simply shared a clock hour training with my fellow school district staff. I was pulled into the vice principal's office and told that I was not allowed to do that. Um, and, you know, questioned as to why I would do that and that I had made people feel uncomfortable. And, and it was absurd to me. 
quite frankly, because people could post things about their multi-level marketing scams that they were part of and, and, you know, blast out emails about that, or, Hey, my home is for sale or I'm selling my old car, but I couldn't send out a professional development clock hours uh, posting that was offered through the ESD 123. So one of the other things that we did um, to try to help advocate for our kids is my mom and I went to um, the Muslim Lobby Day in Olympia. And it was my first time going to lobby in Olympia. And we made a, an appointment with our 16th legislative uh, representative. His name was Mike Hewitt. He's no longer in office, thankfully. Um, and so we went there, we told them about just the survey that we had done of the Sunday school students, that we were teachers, that we were looking for more funding for public school teachers um, in diversity and equity and um, in training dollars. And so he listened to us. And if you know anything about lobbying, you get 15 minutes with your, with your rep. Um, and so you have to be quick. So we're quick. We get done in 10 minutes and we have about like five or less minutes left. And so he has a chance to speak and representative Hewitt says to us, that's all fine and well, but your people have to stop bombing buildings. And, and then the time was up and we were flabbergasted and ha and didn't know what to say. Our, pe our people, what, you know, um, and ushered out of the room by the legislative aid and left fell it, left there feeling more deflated that, that even, you know, the problem wasn't just the peer to peer bullying or that classroom teachers were perpetuating or that school principals and counselors were perpetuating. But the fact that the problem escalated and the, the bigotry, the hate, the Islamophobia was all the way in the people's building in Olympia at the highest level that you could attain just full of, of just stereotype. I mean, my perception of what a, an elected official should be is someone that is representative of the people and has an understanding and is educated and, you know, works tirelessly to remove bias. And this person was full of bias. And so it has been a defining uh, incident in, I would say, my life in seeing that we have work to do at every single level to defend ourselves and to be free to be exactly who we are. You know, a First Amendment right to religion. And we don't have that right because growing up in the place that I grew up, the message was, the message was, don't be yourself, assimilate, speak English, be as white as you can be. And so, you know, that takes some active undoing. Um, and you have to always remember as, as a per woman of color, as a Muslim, um, as a daughter of immigrants that, that I have to actively undo that learning that, that took place at a really early age in the place that I grew up. Um, and so I am, you know, I, I want to, I'm no longer in the classroom, um, but I am an executive director. And so, you know, that is something that I hope in my at least workplace that I encourage and nourish is that we are inclusive and that's the language that we speak. Um, because then that will trickle down to the clients that we serve and the families that we serve. So that's all I've got. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, yes, we're, we're behind you 100% on that, Zara. Thank you so much for sharing your truth and your experience. I wanna do a quick time check because I wanna definitely talk about possible solutions and we've touched on, on this uh, a little bit, but I'd like to go a little deeper. 
I want to ask the panelists, can you stay a few extra minutes if we go past 1.30? I'm looking for nodding heads. Is there anyone who needs to leave right at 1.30? If you do, I certainly understand, but uh, I'd love to, to keep the conversation going for a few more minutes. Okay, so let's, let's move into solutions and strategies and resources to address Islamophobia when it arises. And I'd like to start with our students first, and then I'll be watching your mute buttons. So if you unmute yourself, then I'll call on you. Uh, but uh, I'd like to start with Donna and, and Maham. Uh, we'll go with Donna first and, and then Maham. Uh, Donna, what strategies, solutions, resources would you recommend to address Islamophobia when it comes up? So uh, I think it can be really tricky addressing it as far as staff goes, like student to staff relationships. Um, I think it was Anila that talked about how her niece wrote that letter and I understand how nerve wracking that must be, but um, I've heard of similar situations actually that have happened to my friends and that's been necessary. So I think that's one of the steps students taking initiative when adults act out of place maybe going up to like administration and really like pushing to make sure that there's a solution to the issue. Um, but someone said earlier that students like to see staff members that look like them and I couldn't agree more. I don't think that I would feel as comfortable with any staff member that doesn't identify. I mean, you don't understand the issue or the experiences of that person unless you are that person, unless you are a person of color, you can't talk to, you know, like a white person and have them fully understand that the things that you undergo. So fortunately I had that, I had to be um, when I had school, but students just need to see more staff members that look like them. And then Maham, you said you're from Yakima. So I imagine staff is just, you don't see a lot of staff members that look like you. Yeah, so I don't know how possible that is on this side of the state. I know there are people that look like us, but seeing those people just in itself would make us feel more comfortable in our schools and just having an adult to be able to talk to about the things that we experience. Yeah, thank you, Donna, I appreciate that. And Maham, what strategies and resources would you recommend? Um, well, kind of changing the trainings for teachers, sort of like how Zara was saying, um, how like the teachers were teaching <laughs> the wrong things about Islam. Like, you know, they weren't trying to put um, positivity into the students' brains. More of, I guess like that, they were helping like develop negativity towards Islam um, at an early age. And really like um, what you learn when you're uh, younger really does stick with you like throughout your whole life. Um, and so if we uh, change the teacher trainings, and experience like teachers um, like the correct curriculum and honestly I was talking with uh, Ravine earlier today and we talked about how it would be great if there was a class that talked about the different races and religions and groups um, in today's world and I guess just brought uh, positivity into um, students lives because um, honestly like as a 14 year old girl, um, I am highly influenced by the people around me um, and by what they say, what they do. Um, and so, especially in schools too, when there's all these other kids, um, their behavior does influence you. So if they're like um, rude or, you know, um, mean, then that does rub off um, sometimes on to other kids. And so I feel like if we, change the trainings so that we ask, um, so that teachers um, are more open and teach students to be more open and sort of how like Sabiha um, was talking about how um, in history um, and geography, you need to learn about, um, you know, all the people around the world rather than just, you know, the cities and um, uh, capitals and stuff. Um, so that way kids know more about, um, all the different groups and are more open so that when they grow up, they can make like a better choice <laughs> uh, and have a better opinion and um, know the correct facts. Because a lot of the people I think um, who have Islamophobia don't know the correct facts and um, have developed their opinions based off of what they've heard um, and what's going on around them. And so if they get like the correct education about 
um, a group or religion, then um, I think they can make a better choice and uh, stand on the right side of the war. Um, and yeah, thank you. Can yeah. I add something really quick? Please, yes, go for it. Um, oh my gosh, I just lost it. Okay, no. Um, just education in itself, like, I feel like adults should be educated to a certain extent, like, when Sabiha was talking about how that girl had to remove her hat, whether it's a religious or culture, cultural aspect, sometimes there's intersection between the two, um, but I used to cover, and I distinctly remember going into freshman year, the principal of my school asked me, like, why I wear the hijab, like, it's kind of like a like, are you just trying to get a kick out of me type of thing? Like, he's like, can you take it off? And I said, no, it's like, I wear it for religion. So it's just kind of like a matter of educating yourself. Like that should just kind of be, is it not evident that, you know, Muslims cover because it's a religious purpose? It just kind of felt like this is something you should know. And it's like, if you do know, what was the point of you saying that to me? Yeah, that is a great point. Uh, Anila, yes, go ahead. Sure, so I wanted to just mention one thing, and this is specifically about the underreporting that Sabiha was talking about. That is absolutely real, and it's beyond students, it's Muslims in general as well, including specific attacks even uh, about reporting to police, and there's some concerns there. But the, so knowing that there's such significant underreporting of these instances of bias and bigotry and bullying, the fact that we have those statistics, like the 42% of Muslim students being bullied from ISPU or what Zara mentioned about the 100% statistic, that makes those statistics even more troubling. And it should be something that troubles all of us. Uh, but beyond that, I want to say that part of the problem around this is what uh, Donna and, and Maham already touched on, which is the curriculum, the training for, for teachers specifically, the lack of religious literacy that we have. Uh, specifically, the majority of our fellow Americans, unfortunately, do not know much about Islam and don't personally know a Muslim. And that's actually a recipe for disaster when you have this whole industry promoting misinformation, lies, uh, and, and these sort of false tropes and stereotypes that are often reinforced even through the curriculum that are used in schools. So we definitely need better training uh, in schools and better curriculums as well. And all of us, especially the adults in, in schools, should be educating ourselves around some of these things so you don't put the burden on somebody like Donna to have to explain a, a very basic religious fact that no teacher should be questioning here in 2021 at least, right? And then also like some of the curriculum, some of the programs that are used and some of the teachings and even videos that are used. I've heard about horrible videos that are shown in classroom that are directly anti-Muslim that are promoted by teachers in their classrooms. And that has to be addressed as well. And it's not enough to just do a Google search in response to sort of, hey, let me find an answer about Islam or Muslims uh, via Google because there's so much misinformation out there promoting by the, the hate industry that it isn't the best resource to go to to get information. As I often say, we need to learn Islam from Muslims, not anti-Muslims, and not from some of the worst criminal elements of a faith tradition. Like nobody would think it would be fair or appropriate for me to learn about Christianity or about Jesus from the KKK, for instance, or the Lord's Resistance Army. Yet that's what we do with Islam and Muslims. And not only is it uh, normalized and accepted, but it's even justified at times, including by teachers and educators. And right now we're seeing a general attack on ethnic studies, for instance, which is an effort to try to combat the very sort of uh, white centered focused uh, uh, history and geography and everything else that is taught in schools. And now it's under the rubric of attacking critical race theory, but we are seeing that happening in schools. So there is a push to uh, sort of backlash to the fine, you know, the belated racial reckoning that we've recently seen uh, in our country. So a few things that can that people can do. I included specific resources in the chat. I hope those will be included as a follow up message to all attendees, and including those who might not uh, be following on chat but are following on Facebook. But speaking up is so important. Silence is a direct affirmation of the racism and a perpetuation of it. And as I said before, you know, Islamophobia does not just hurt Muslims. It hurts all of us as Americans. It promotes the bigotry against other marginalized 
marginalized groups as well. And it allows for foreign policy decisions and the kind of misinformation out there that actually makes all Americans less safe and less secure and more for sort of policies that strip any of us of our civil liberties and civil rights. So we really want to sort of combat this. And then some a point that I want to really emphasize is the fact that specifically with uh, with Islamophobia, anti uh, sort of um, facts themselves do not change hearts and minds. I see this often. I have the response to every single myth and misconception that's promoted out there about Islam and Muslims. And I could share all those, whether statistics, the statistics about who is actually a threat on our soil in our country. You know, it's often portrayed as Muslims or black and brown folks, when in fact, we know that's not the actual source, according to the FBI, and report after report about the actual source of threat in our country. Whether it's about women's rights, whether it's about uh, peace, whether it's about Islam and other faith traditions, I could address all of those, but that alone, those facts and stats and data, it's not enough. We need a real narrative shift. And that's the part that every single individual, whether they're a student, whether they're a teacher, whether they're a community member, every single member can use the power of their voice to help challenge narratives and not just challenge by saying, oh, that's not true, or you know, saying making comments that actually reinforce negative stereotypes, but rather by creating a new narrative. So for example, some of the specific things, when you hear somebody make an anti-Muslim comment, what I tell people is you, you could say something like, you know what? That's not true. Let me tell you about the Muslims I know and then share positive personal stories if you have them or share stories that you've heard about, about Muslims. That's a way to humanize instead of repeating and reinforcing the negative tropes or the negative stereotypes. Another tool that people can use in their everyday life is when they hear somebody make an anti-Muslim comment, and this applies to any kind of discrimination as well, but they could say something like, um, wh why do you say that? Why do you believe that? Or you know, any kind of question that forces the person who made the bigoted comments to have to actually uh, explain. And then the, through that explanation, they're put in a defense position. They're actually, you know, their Islamophobia or bigotry can be exposed. So that's really, really critical. And I would also say that Having said all of this, you know, and we've talked a lot about the, the harms and, and the problems of Islamophobia, I will say one thing, no matter how bad things may seem, American Muslims and, and others, friends and allies who stand with us, we are not allowing this hate and discrimination to continue unchallenged. And it's actually really inspiring to see people coming together and especially the American Muslim youth themselves and American Muslims all together, uh, showing the kind of resilience and power uh, with our friends and allies and building coalitions and helping helping people understand how interconnected these various issues are and really stand united in combating all forms of hate and bigotry. And we have the power, the, the possibility, the potential, and the privilege or even responsibility right now to take this kind of action to protect American Muslim students and all students in our, in our school system. Yeah, thank you so much, Anila. And I really appreciate the resources that you've shared. I will not only include them in the follow-up email to this webinar, but I'll also put them in the webinar description in the YouTube recording, which will be accessible too. So yes, I will make sure that those resources can be seen easily. Nagmana, what would you like to add? I was just gonna add quickly that I, you know, as I said, I live in Spokane, which is not all that diverse and therefore one of the things that folks that I've encouraged people that I do myself is I invite people to dinner, you know, somebody who's different, who's not from my ethnicity, which is very easy to do living here. Um, so if you are white and want to know more about, say, Islam or whomever that person is down the street living from you, you don't know what their religion is, what their ethnicity is. Invite them to dinner, sit down, break bread with them and talk to them about it. That's something that can be done on a personal level any day of the week. And what that does is it normalizes your interaction. It normalizes how you approach other cultures. It normalizes uh, your acceptance level. It, 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 it creates understanding and awareness. And, and I feel that that is so important for especially our younger, our kids, you know, for them to know and understand because kids understand race at a very, very elementary level. They understand race really well. So just to normalize someone's holiday or someone's headdress or the way that they speak or, you know, their color, um, there are so many children's books out there now that are helpful. Never used to be the case when I was growing up or even when my son was little for that matter. Nothing I could see, I couldn't find much, but now that's not the case. You, you can find pretty much anything 
um, out there if you if you look. But start from your home. Start inviting people, sitting down with them, talking with them, having tea with them, having dinner with them. When you break bread with somebody, it's really hard to hate them. Thanks. Yeah, that is great advice, Nagamada. I appreciate that. Sabiha, Zara, in the last few minutes, is there anything that either of you would like to add? Ami, you're on mute. Um, and one thing that I want to say is be brave, okay? When I uh, got the uh, person from Georgetown University, the first uh, teacher training that I provided through clock hours from OSPI, I had seven Baptist church ministers show up at the school district to counter that and say, that why, who's doing this? Why is this doing? Why aren't Christian? Why are we presenting a seminar on Christianity? Why are we doing this on Islam? So we got to be brave and we got to do it. The, the, all these training, I'm part of, I'm on the DEI committee with the Richland School District. We are making policy. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere until we uh, do our job as, as you know, good citizens. In a, good, in a democracy and elect the right school board members. Because it's the school board members who are driving. If there's a backlash because of the Black Lives Movement that don't want us to teach what we are teaching already. And so all these changes and trainings that you're going to say are not going to happen if we don't elect good school board members who are open-minded and uh, are willing to do all of this. Uh, storytelling is extremely important. I think Nagmana said that too. And I think a, a lot of responsibility rests with the Muslims also. I strongly believe this and I say it to my friends, um, not, a lot, not many of them actually go and put themselves out there and are outgoing enough to go and share their story or, or Give, provide the opportunity for others, their neighbors to get to know them. That's something that is our responsibility also to, to do. And of course, provide resources. So for example, at my school, everybody knows I'm a Muslim and I'm a history teacher and I'm the only history teacher in the entire school district. And I'm the only um, uh, person of color who teaches an academic subject. I mean, we have Spanish colored teachers of color and we have English as a, as a second language, persons of color, but not nobody's teaching an academic subject who's a person of color, at least in my school. So they have never, I've offered myself and said, you ever have a, you know, the, the uh, have a unit on comparative religion, please um, approach me. I would love to come and speak to your kids about it. But they have never, ever, approached me and said, hey, you know, I'm teaching this unit on Islam and today is my lecture in Islam. Why don't you come to my classroom and talk about it? So I don't know how to break that barrier because they know me. They, they've known me for many, many years. And lastly, I would like to put myself as a resource out there. So whoever is watching this webinar, webinar, please reach out to me. I will be more than glad to do a training for your school, high school, middle school, elementary school teachers training on how to teach about Islam in your schools. And maybe Anila might pair up with me on some of them. And of course, Anila is an excellent resource to also invite for a teacher training. And we have plenty of the, the legislature just um, approved that bill, uh, 5024, I think it was. 5044, yes. 5044, that um, has been a while. <laughs> so that uh, all um, Washington state teachers will uh, spend the, the three in-service days that we have, the professional development days, one of those three days will be spent on equity and inclusion. And so people like Anila, people like Zara and me should be should be approached and we could train those teachers and and bring a panel of students to share our stories as well. So share my email address and, and have people contact me. I'd love to teach them how to teach about Islam. That would be great. Uh, and Zahra and, and Anila, would it be okay if I include your contact information in the follow-up email? Um, not mine, please. And I was going to tangentially just say that kind of contradict my mom a little bit, but 
you know, for me personally, I feel like I wear so many hats in my community and I'm go to for city council and in the developmentally delayed disabled community as, uh, you know, for my organization, um, Muslim community, advocate community. And so one of the things that I just want to say as someone who's been an active advocate and activist is that I'm tired. And so my, my raised beds, my little garden is run rampant with weeds. And there are times where, yes, I'm brave and I put myself out there, but I literally just want to go do my gardening and I don't want to have to be a superhero and put that cape on and go do those things. Sometimes I just want to like cocoon and be in my home and do those things. And so my message is that please, if you are, you know, if you are a friend or an ally to someone who is Muslim or, um, you know, a person of color, um, or any sort of underserved, underrepresented community, be a good ally and show up, you know, ask how you can help, ask what you can do. And because sometimes my, my tank is on empty. And so, um, and I don't always have the capacity to do the work. So, yeah, but I'm here today. <laughs> Yes, and thank you for being here today. As we wrap up, I just want to turn back to our students real quick. Uh, Maham and, and Donna, do you have any last words that you would like to give before we close? And if not, that's okay. I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Um, I did have one last thought. Um, if people could have focused more on, um, especially when the teachers share about 9-11, you know, that's a really important thing. And people don't realize that Muslims were also affected by 9-11. So if during, you know, those teacher trainings, if we could talk about how to teach um, about 9-11 without, you know, um, making the Muslim kids uncomfortable, because um, there are videos that sometimes teachers share that say like Muslim terrorists and, you know, um, that um, are anti-Muslim. So um, if teachers are given the uh, proper, if they want to share videos or teach about 9-11, um, if they're given like, videos that are um, reviewed and um, have been determined that they don't, um, they're not anti-Muslim. Um, and if they're just taught how to teach about 9-11, because it is important and it is something that should be taught about um, and discussed because um, it, it was um, a tragic event. But if it can be taught to the teachers how to teach that um, without offending the Mus- Islam um, and the Muslim kids, Um, Because I know I've felt uncomfortable in my classes before when they talk about 9-11 because there are words like Muslim terrorists and, you know, um, it is a little like um, uncomfortable to think about um, what are kids going to react towards me after class today? Like, are they going to be rude or make any mean comments? Um, So, yeah, if we can just um, (laughs) train teachers to um, teach um, properly about, I guess, 9-11, it'd be really helpful. Yeah. Can I say something really quick to Maham's response? Is Maham, I want you to do something. So well, I'm on the task force for educa- education through the racial and uh, justice and social equity committee in the Tri Cities. And one of the things we've done is we've established a task force for education, and we are specifically focusing on racial justice in school. And one of the things that uh, the school um, ASB president at Hanford High School. She is developing a a, a rapid response uh, Google form where students uh, can quickly um, fill in things like, so if you watch a video in your classroom on 9-11 that was offensive to you and you thought it was one-sided, you fill out that form and you uh, send it in to uh, your ASB or to your leadership teacher or to the principal or whoever. So being a leader in in this uh, in your own school, you can start doing that. One of the things that I've suggested that schools do or kids do or ASBs do is maybe that, you know how we have these schools, the Google schools and the gate schools because they have checked so many boxes on the STEM education. So now they are a blue ribbon school for 
gates or why don't we establish something like that for diversity, equity, and inclusion? So I think some of the, the uh, students can do a lot. If you form a club and you demand that, and you, uh, uh, you can do a lot more at times than I can going to the principal. Yeah, thank you, Sabiha. And uh, Donna, do you have anything else you'd like to, uh, to leave us with? Okay, sorry, there's going to be background noise. Um, I just wanted to say, um, <laughs> sorry, um, just call stuff out when you see it. If you haven't before, just make an effort to do that. Um, or if you see students like being mean to each other, I imagine a lot of the attendees are um, staff members, sorry. Um, yeah, just call stuff out when you see it. I wanted to say Zahra said it gets exhausting because it feels like you're doing the work for yourself. Um, but I'm very hopeful in this generation and seeing Maham too, and just seeing American Muslim students and what they're doing, even at the university level, like the Muslim Student Association. I'm just very excited to see like how our generation moves forward and makes a change. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Donna. And thank you, Maham, Donna, Anila, Nagmana, Sabia, and Zara. And thank you to everyone who attended and participated and submitted questions. Please save the date for our statewide virtual event, free virtual event on October 7th, focused on supporting students impacted by COVID-19. First, we will hear from former U.S. Education Secretary, Dr. John B. King Jr., President of the Education Trust, and Dr. Vin Gupta, public health physician, professor, health policy expert, and regular health policy analyst for NBC News, NSNBC, and contributor to the New York Times and CNN. And they'll be exploring the academic and mental health impacts on students during the pandemic. Then join us as we break into groups to discuss how we can support students across Washington State moving forward. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, and I'll also share the registration information in the follow-up email that will arrive in your inbox in about 24 hours. That will also have the resources that Anila suggested as well. So again, Anila, thank you so much for all of those. Thank you again for each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, just go to our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Maham, Donna, Anila, Nagmana, Sabiha, and Zara, thank you again for joining us and sharing your perspectives, your wisdom, and your truth, and for all you do for Washington students and families. May you have a great rest of your week. <laughs>